Hi everyone, it's Sue Coffey here, and I'm going to take a few minutes to talk to you about the CJMM, the Clinical Judgment Measure Measurement Model. That's been developed by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, and it really builds on what we already do in terms of a problem-solving model to broaden it and expand it to a clinical judgment model. So I hope you find this um, uh, interesting and exciting as we think about the development of nursing knowledge. Why do we need this kind of model? Uh, we've got the nursing process. Some of you know more about it than others. Some have had more experience with it, but for 50 years, we've used this problem solving process and we call it the nursing process. And it had initially four um, steps, moved to five steps, and eventually even first in some um, iterations had a six step. And it was um, a process where we began with assessment, assessment of your client and the situation. Developing a diagnosis. Now, this was not a medical diagnosis. It's a nursing diagnosis. Um, there was a, an organization, uh, NANDA, North American Nursing Diagnosis Association, that was formed, and they began the um, work of developing nursing-specific language, the way medicine has specific language. Um, and so instead of making a medical diagnosis, which would be beyond our, would be beyond our scope, so we wouldn't say a patient had pneumonia, we would say um, alteration in breathing pattern, associated with um, um, decreased breath sound, something like that. So it's all nursing language, but it would um, clearly depict the clinical situation. The challenge was nobody really knew that language, but some nurses and mostly nursing students, it wasn't uh, adopted well in practice and it became actually a barrier to communication instead of a helper to communication. Uh, there also, uh, fairly recently, became uh, a movement to include outcome identification. So specifically, very early in the process, after you've done your assessment, you're then going to determine what are the outcomes I'm looking for. So if a patient is short of breath, what outcome am I looking for? I'm looking for a decrease in that shortness of breath, right? A decrease in that work of breathing, perhaps. So we identify that outcome early. We move to our planning stage. So how do I plan uh, to... to um, Lead, what plans are in place that will lead to that outcome? Uh, what do I need to do how, in what order and how would I do that? And then you'd implement that plan, so implementation. And then finally, a critical step evaluation. Now, too often this was represented linearly, go from assessment all the way to evaluation, when in fact, it's very iterative or cyclical. So assessment, diagnosis, outcome identification, planning, implementation, evaluation, and around and around and around. And that helps you to really continue to reassess the situation. But what we found, even though this is well refined, we've used it for more than 50 years, there are still too many really serious errors in practice, including most fundamentally failure to rescue. And failure to rescue is uh, when we go back into a chart on a patient who has um, uh, succumbed to their illness, who has died. We can recognize that early signs of a deteriorating condition were not uh, recognized they weren't taken up. And so then um, active uh, intervention was not started early enough. And so that failure to rescue means that I haven't intervened early enough in a situation where I really could have made a difference and likely changed the outcome for that patient. And that's devastating for nurses and devastating for families and of course patients. Um, and so for the last 15 years, we've tried to open our minds a little bit around how can we first either revise that nursing process expand the nursing process or develop a process that really takes into account the thinking, so the cognitive skills that are necessary to be an effective um, nurse. And what we know is we focus so much on the skills, the technical skills in nursing school and as um, um, very young nurses um, because they seem foreign and, it, and they're very visible. That's like performance art, but ultimately our um, our understanding is that nursing is uh, happen. It, nursing is um, knowledge, right? Nursing happens with the judgment and the decision making, and then we we act on it. And we need to have that technical proficiency, absolutely, but that nursing fundamentally is knowledge work. So the thinking processes that we use are critical to the care that we provide. And so uh, what we've come to see is that it's more important that we really focus on that cognitive capacity and move away from just that sort of problem solving process that we saw in that nursing process to expand it into a clinical judgment focus. 
and really that we learn to enhance and refine our clinical judgment, and that makes a difference to patient care. So in the CJMM, Clinical Judgment Measurement Model, uh, one of the exciting things is that it's evidence-based. We put evidence right into practice at the point of care, and it helps, it helps us to make those clinical judgments that are going to continuously refine our practice, our practice. And ultimately, there are six cognitive skills that have been identified as essential to this, uh, this model, the CJMM, and that really work, again, in a stepwise fashion, but it is always cyclical or iterative. Right? We don't go from beginning to end and stop. We, go, we continue to go around and around as necessary. And so these are the six steps, and then we're going to go through them one by one with some examples. So step number one, we need to recognize cues. What am I seeing in the environment? What am I um, assessing? What is relevant? What's important? We need to analyze those cues. So what does this mean? How relevant is it to this situation? What is uh, more important and less important? We need to then generate some hypotheses. What could be going on? So I recognize some cues and then I've analyzed them to say, what do they mean? But how does this create that clinical picture for me? What is going on? What are my, what are my hypotheses? And then prioritize your hypotheses. You might think three or four things could be going on, but I need to prioritize them because not all things are equal, right? Based on this process, we then need to generate some solutions. Okay, I've got my hypotheses and I've decided what, are, what is the most important or the, the two most important. And then I need to generate solutions. What am I gonna do? Based on those hypotheses, what am I gonna do? What are the possible solutions? And from those possible solutions, we take action. And that action is broad ranging, it can be independent. So for example, um, a patient could be um, in pain, and an independent action might be that I position the patient more comfortably. And uh, a dependent action that's dependent on the role of another care provider. So in, in the case of um, providing medication, that would be based on the physician. So that would be a dependent action. I could seek an order for um, analgesia or an interdependent between myself and that other care provider would be that I'm responsible for monitoring the side effects and knowing the clinical indications and contraindications for that pain medication. And then finally, the last step I've taken, I've, so I've recognized the cues. What are the cues in this situation? I've analyzed those cues to see what do they all mean and what's important. I've, I've prioritized my hypotheses. So I've come up with some hypotheses about what's going on. And then I've decided what is most important. Um, I then, uh, generated some solutions. Given these hypotheses, the, in particular those really important ones, what uh, solutions are possible here? Then I've taken action based on those solutions. In order to come to that solution, what action do I need to take? And then finally, I'm evaluating the outcome. Now let's think about the first step. What do we need to do when we talk about recognizing cues? Uh, first, we're going to say, what cue did you even see? If the patient is short of breath, are they using their shoulders to breathe? Do they have nasal flaring? Um, are they able to speak full sentences? Uh, just a, does someone have a cough? If a patient is um, uh, feeling weak or tired, do they have, what do their vital signs look like? So what are all those cues? And of those cues, which ones are the most significant, right? Which ones are the most significant? Um, and then as you're considering what's most significant, you also wanna consider what information is less significant? So what information is less important and what information is um, distracting, right? So there's lots of cues, there's lots of things going on all the time, but not everything is really relevant to this situation. Um, and so it's really important that you, you begin to refine that ability to tease that apart. Lots of things may come out of an assessment. What is most important? What is the most significant findings? what's less significant and even maybe distracting in the situation. So let's look at an unfolding case study. And this is the, um, the, the, uh, one of the methods of questions that you'll see on the new generation NCLEX exam. So here we have a 78 year old female and she's brought to the emergency department by her daughter. She's got increased shortness of breath and her daughter says she's been running a fever for a few days and has started to cough up some greenish colored mucus and to complain of soreness throughout her body. She was recently hospitalized for issues with AFib six days ago, and she has a history of um, high blood pressure. 
So on arrival, her vital signs were a temp of 38.4. They also give you a Fahrenheit temp. Pulse 92, respiratory rate 22, BP 156 on 86, and pulse ox was 94% on O2 two liters by nasal cannula. And so we see she's got a fever. Her heart rate was in, is within the normal range. The respiratory rate is just above the normal range. And blood pressure is, uh, is she is um, hypertensive, but we know she has a history of hypertension as well, right? Uh, on assessment, the client's breathing appears slightly labored. She's got coarse crackles as noted in bilateral lung bases. So coarse crackles in both her lung bases. Uh, she has skin that's slightly cool to touch and uh, pale pink in tone. She's got pulse uh, three plus and irregular, okay? But we know she's got a history of AFib, right? Uh, capillary refill is three seconds. Uh, she's alert and oriented to person, place, and time. And her daughter says, sometimes it seems like my mother is confused. So what you need to do here is drag and drop the four client findings that would require follow-up. So we've got six things. You're only gonna drag four things when we think of what needs follow-up, okay? What needs follow-up? Uh, vital signs? I think vital signs need follow-up. She's got a fever, right? And she, her respiratory rate is um, elevated. Uh, lung sounds? Yep, do you think that needs follow-up? Yeah, I think it does because what? Because she's got crackles bilaterally in her bases. Capillary refill. Well, capillary refill was normal, right? Does that need follow-up? No. Nope. Client orientation. Now here's where something can be distracting. So right now for you, she's alert and oriented to person, place, and time. But her daughter says, sometimes it seems like my mother is confused. So that is an important cue at some point to follow up on. There's lots of things. Now you can end up with confusion with uh, acute illnesses, but right now she's alert and oriented times three. So that's one of those things that I would, I think is distracting because that client orientation, even though her daughter says sometimes she seems to be confused is not relevant right at this moment, right? So we're going to put it off to the side. If you don't forget it, but we're going to put it off to the side. So that also is not something to worry about. Um, radial pulse characteristics, absolutely. And I'm, I just apologize for my dog. Uh, radial pulse, pulse characteristics, absolutely. Because why? Because she is, um, she's in AFib, right? It's irregular, she has a history of AFib. And characteristics of the cough, in particular, she's coughing up greenish colored mucus, right? Greenish colored mucus. So that is really critical. Hey guys, so I think my dog is stopped and my daughter is not going to be uh, video bombing us anymore, at least for the moment. So let's carry on. Oh gosh. There we go. So we've assessed uh, our patient and the situation and we have assessed our cues. Now we need to analyze them, right? What do those cues tell us? Uh, and so these are some of the questions that we want to ask. Uh, what did we expect based on our client's concern? Right? So she had a fever, she had a cough. What did we expect? Are we surprised when she's coughing up some greenish phlegm or sputum that she has crackles in her bases? Not really, because fever and coughing up green sputum, we're automatically starting to think, is there an infective process, right? Uh, what other information can we gather that will help us to determine how significant those cues are? And that's an important, always assessing beyond the basics of what we've got. And then how do you bring sets of information together, right? How do you, uh, instead of thinking of a hundred different pieces of information, how does it come together into one picture, that clinical picture? And so let's go look back and we've got our same patient history, right? So this is this unfolding case study and we're, we still have just the same information, but we're gonna use a little bit more of a thinking process. And we're gonna look below and for each of those symptoms, fever, confusion, body soreness, cough and sputum, shortness of breath, we are going to say, which disease process here might it be related to? Fair enough, right? So uh, fever, do you get a fever with pneumonia? Mm -hmm. UTI, can you get a fever with UTI? Mm -hmm. Influenza, can you get a fever with influenza? Mm -hmm. So we would check, 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 okay? Now, what about confusion? For sure, confusion is a hallmark of UTI in the elderly. 
So for sure it's a hallmark there, but actually you can get confusion with both pneumonia and influenza as well. <coughs> what about body soreness? Yeah, interesting, interesting question. And actually, while it may be hallmark for uh, pneumonia for sure, uh, and influenza, influenza really characterized by that body soreness, you get that with UTI in the elderly as well. So you're getting that across all three, although body soreness is really characteristic of influenza. Cough and sputum. Now this is important. Uh, UTI, do we have cough and sputum? No, so that's out. Influenza, we do have a cough, but what's different about the cough with influenza from the cough with pneumonia? It's the presence of sputum. A cough with influenza is that dry cough. It's, it can be quite tiring, uh, but it's that dry cough. So cough with sputum is gonna go right under the influenza, or I, sorry, I'm so sorry, under the pneumonia tab. And what about shortness of breath? If influenza gets quite serious and very late, you might see shortness of breath, but again, very characteristic of pneumonia. So we're really gonna see that as pneumonia. So you see our tick marks are really leading us to pneumonia. Some things may cross boundaries, uh, fever for sure, all of them. Confusion, we said hallmark of UTI, although you can have it with the others, but hallmark of UTI. Body soreness, often we see that as the hallmark of influenza, but you can have it with the others. Uh, cough and sputum, absolutely pneumonia, right? Absolutely pneumonia, because it's that sputum, shortness of breath. You may see it with later stage influenza, like a very serious late stage, but hallmark of pneumonia. Okay, so let's carry on. Now, remember, we've assessed our cues, we've analyzed our cues, and now we're moving on to generating our hypotheses. So what's happening here, right? What's occurring? Why do we think that's the case? What will we have? What will happen if we do nothing? What else might be going on? We don't want to get tunnel vision. The risk when we get tunnel vision is that we um, uh, miss other available cues and we act, we continue to act in one, with one plan in one direction when we might be missing really important information that would lead us to other, um, uh, to other treatments. We have to, when we've got all of these hypotheses, we have to decide which is the most important, not just generating hypotheses, but we need to prioritize them as well, right? Which hypotheses is the most important because that's what we need to address first. And what are the risks if I leave the other ones um, for later, right? What are the risks? So we've got our same case study. And here is another question. And it says, complete the following uh, sentence by choosing from the list from the drop down menu. And the, and the sentence is, the client is at highest risk for developing blank as evidenced by blank. Now we don't have those drop-ins uh, to, to decide this. So I'm not gonna give you a definitive answer here. What I would say, so as a very experienced nurse, there's lots of things that I could uh, fill in with that. She's at highest risk for developing pneumonia as evidenced by um, uh, fever, cough, sputum, green sputum, uh, decrease, uh, let's see, her ox uh, yeah, she's, she's only at 94% oxygen, two liters by prong, so her requirement for oxygen, something like that, okay? So depending on what those drop downs show, lots of things uh, could be revealed, but it, it's based on what we just went through about what are those symptoms most likely associated with? So now we've, we've um, uh, uh, developed our hypotheses, generated hypotheses, and then prioritized them. And then we need to generate some solutions. Now I've got an, a, a hypothesis about what's going on. She's at higher risk for pneumonia, as evidenced by those symptoms. Uh, but what are the solutions, right? And you need to give at least um, uh, desired outcomes for at least two hypotheses. You always want to have that broad perspective, right? So what interventions are needed and what interventions critically should be avoided as well, because we don't want to do harm, even though it's inadvertent. So here we've got our patient again, and we've got the original note. And then at 12 o'clock, we see there's an additional narrative note. It says you're called to the bedside by the daughter who states that the mother um, isn't acting right. And you assess the patient. She's difficult to rouse, so that's a change, right? She was alert and oriented when she came in. She's pale and diaphoretic, and do you remember her skin was pink and, and dry when she came in? Vital signs, her temp is still 38.6, so not much change. Uh, 
Uh, pulse is 112. Respiratory rate is 32. Now remember, she came in at 22, and 32 is very significantly tachypneic. Blood pressure 90 on 62. Now remember, she was hypertensive when she came in, 152 on, I think it looks like 86. Uh, and now she is, uh, she has a blood pressure of 90 on 62, a very significant drop. And her pulse oximetry has gone down to 91% on O2 two liters by nasal pumps. Was 94, now it's gone down to 92. So let's go over to this type of questioning. You look at those nurses' notes, and it says for each possible nursing intervention, and it lists some for us here, what you want to do is determine if that intervention is indicated, if it's non-essential, so it could be possible you might want to do this, but it's not a priority, and what's contraindicated. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Prepare the, the client for defibrillation. Now, defibrillation is application of energy, right? You're going to put those pads on. Uh, application of energy for a shockable rhythm. And there are only two shockable rhythms. Ventricular fibrillation and pulseless VTAC. Right? So the patient is awake and alive and has a pulse. So she doesn't have... Uh, ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC, we are not going to defibrillate, and should we defibrillate, we probably would, would lead to catastrophic outcomes. So that is contraindicated, defibrillation contraindicated. Place the patient in Sammy Fowler's position. Now think about this, and it's always important to really recognize what are independent actions that nurses can do, not just what I need an order for, what could I do independently? Your patient's respiratory rate has gone up, so she's, the work of breathing is, is higher, She's diaphoretic, but her blood pressure has dropped. Now, here's the challenge. You've got competing demands. If she was sitting upright, so she might be sitting right upright in bed in high fowlers, then I would want to lower her head uh, to support her breathing. But if I put her flat, then the work of breathing is really accentuated and she will become acutely short of breath. So I think that from high fowlers to semi fowlers would make sense. What if she's already flat? First of all, most patients who are short of breath wouldn't be flat, so, but I can't assume that here. If she's flat, now her blood pressure is low, but her respiratory rate is 32. So I'm going to manage several things, but again, I think I need to raise that head, not to high fowlers, but semi fowlers, because I need to support her ability to expand her chest, and that is, that's going to be best supported in semi fowlers. So do you see how I have to think my way through it? And I actually would say that's indicated, not that it's non-essential. If she's lying flat, for sure I'd have to bring that head up a little bit to help her. If she's upright, for sure with that blood pressure, I'd have to bring her head down to support her blood pressure a little bit, but not flat. Remember, we're going to precipitate a respiratory arrest. So I think that I would say that is indicated. And you think, oh, is that, that's not so important. I need all the other really high-tech uh, interventions. Changing the patient's positioning can be critical to survival as much as anything else. So putting her in a position for her own physiology, her own body to respond to this challenge. So a uh, client in semi fowlers is indicated. Um, request in order to increase the oxygen flow rate. Well, she's on two liters. Her O2 sat is 91. Is that acceptable? No, we're looking for uh, 95 and above, right? So anything below, below that, 94 and below, we want uh, oxygen to increase that O2 sac. So absolutely. Now, would that be indicated or non-essential? Right, indicated because uh, oxygenation is critical to survival, right? And adequate oxygenation is critical uh, for our body to be able to um, provide oxygen right down to the cellular level. Uh, request an, admor an, uh, an order to administer an intravenous fluid bolus. Hmm, what do you think? Now her blood pressure has dropped from 152 on 86 to 90 over 62, and her heart rate has gone up from 92 to 112. So her heart rate has gone up by 20 points and her blood pressure has uh, dropped by like very significantly. What do you think about a fluid bolus to support her uh, blood pressure while we're determining next steps? Yeah, absolutely, that would be critical and that would be indicated. And then finally, the last one, request an order to insert an additional peripheral venous access device, right? So a second intravenous. Well, I might in this kind of situation want a second intravenous because if I'm gonna be giving a lot of meds, if I think this patient may go into shock, a whole bunch of things may, may lead me to the decision that a second IV may be a good idea, but is it critical right now? Is it indicated 
versus non-essential in the moment. I'm going to say non-essential in the moment. Ultimately, I probably would, but if I, I'm thinking this process through, if I'm going to give a bolus, I can give that by an IV pump. If I'm going to give an antibiotic, which likely I'm starting to think I might, can I give that antibiotic at the same time as I'm giving the fluid bolus? I can, because they'll both be by pump. So as long as I'm going to be giving those medications by pump, it would be safe. So I'm going to say that is, I would do that, but it's non-essential. Okay, next up. Now remember, we have assessed cues. We have analyzed those cues to figure out what they mean. We generated some hypotheses and prior prioritized them. And then we've come up with those solutions. And again, prioritized our solutions. Now we've got to take action. We've got some solutions. What action do we need to take? And what do we need to take immediately? What can you delegate to someone? And who do you delegate it to? Um, what are the mechanisms of action of any of the medications you get when you're giving? What are the major nursing considerations? Uh, is there any patient teaching that's really important here? And always and always, we're keeping in, in, in mind what is an ISBAR report. Uh, it says SBAR here, but we always uh, include the I, which is the introduction. Hi, I'm Sue. I'm calling from the emergency department today. However, you're going to introduce yourself. Uh, and for any handoff and referrals. And so important that we've always got that in the back of our mind, introduction, um, what is the um, situation, what's the background, what's the assessment, and critically, what are my recommendations? Uh, so when you're asking for those orders, recommendation for increasing oxygen, recommendation for a fluid bolus, all of those things, you need to be prepared uh, to provide that, that clinical picture. So taking action is this next step. And let's look at our case study, same information, right? We've got that same information, nothing has changed there. Uh, and so, uh, so you receive orders from a physician and these are all the orders and what should, should you perform right away? So we've got insert and indwelling urinary catheter and we know with potty, we're all, always very cautious uh, about inserting a fully catheter, um, but uh, the physician has ordered it and we may wanna do that because she's 78 and we wanna watch her urinary output if we're bolusing her uh, and potentially she may be going into shock. So there's a lot of reasons we would think back and forth on that. Would that be most urgent? It would not be most urgent. Now we've got an order for antibiotics, uh, vancomycin, a gram, IV every 12 hours. Would I start that? Absolutely, absolutely. I would start that. If the medication is not, if I'm on a unit, the medication's not there, I'd be calling pharmacy to get it right away. I'm not waiting for a standardized time. I'm getting it right away. A CT scan of the chest, that's gonna give us a good look at her chest. Do I need to do that before I start these things? No, this patient is unstable. Remember, her heart rate has gone up by 20 points and her blood pressure has dropped dramatically. Her respiratory rate is 32. Certainly, we're going to have to treat this patient and stabilize her before we would send her over for a CT scan. And then there's some lab work here, a blood culture. That's really important if we think that she may be septic, if she's got an infection that's localized to her lungs versus does she have an infection that has spread in her bloodstream. We're going to do a CBC and that's going to tell us about her white blood count, right? And uh, we're gonna do ABGs. So arterial blood gases are really important here. They give us such a big picture of what's going on at the cellular level uh, in terms of her, um, uh, the effectiveness of her respiratory processes as opposed to just looking at her oxygen saturation. So the three priorities makes perfect sense, doesn't it? That you're gonna give her that bolus, start the vancomycin right away and get those labs drawn, okay? And then, same thing as, as uh, we talked about in the nursing process, we need to evaluate the outcomes. There's no point in following orders and then not paying attention to what those orders lead to, right? We absolutely need to do that. And so in evaluating outcomes, we say, what, what follow-up data do I need to collect? What do I need to assess again? What do I need, um, what's gonna tell me if, what I, uh, if uh, the orders or what I engaged in was effective or not? What, how do I know if, if what we're doing is working for this patient, right? Uh, and what are the critical values to monitor? right? Critical values. And so look, we've got this case study again, and we've got uh, the same story, but we have some assessment findings. Let's say I go back in to assess this patient, and I see some assessment findings. And for each of those assessment findings, we want to look back at the original note and the second note and say, um, based on what we see here uh, in, in the assessment findings, uh, is are they improved, no change, or decline? And in particular, we're comparing that to the last set, right? Last set, or the last, the last note, right? We always keep the whole story in our minds, 
because we look at a progression, but we're comparing what we see now to the last note in which we had we um, assessed cues and had to determine what was going on, generate, uh, generated some hypotheses, took action, and um, now we're evaluating that. So let's look. Respiratory rate 36. What was her last respiratory rate? It was 32. So is this improved, no change, or declined? It's declined. Her blood pressure is 118 over 68. What do we think about that? Last blood pressure was 90 over 62. Good, right? That's improved. Her skin is pale. Now, what was her skin the last time? She was uh, pale. She was pale and she was diaphoretic. It doesn't say anything about whether it's warm and dry or it just says pale skin tone. So I'd say no change, right? She's still pale. Pulse ox is reading 91% on the oxygen that we've applied. And it was 91% before. So we're gonna say no change. And she's interacting with her uh, daughter at the bedside. And what was her last level of consciousness? She was difficult to rouse. So we're gonna say that is improved as well. It's important to recognize a couple of things are uh, improved, blood pressure and interacting with her daughter. Those are improved. So her level of consciousness and her uh, blood pressure have improved. Her skin tone is the same, her pulse ox is the same, and her respiratory rate has declined. So even though her um, heart rate, or sorry, her, her blood pressure has come up and she's more alert, her respiratory rate has declined. And it's really important that we recognize, even though I have completed those interventions and I see that blood pressure coming up and I see her more awake. And so you might start to think, okay, we're on the right track. Her respiratory rate is a critical finding here, right? Because she has a pneumonia. Her respiratory rate is double what uh, you would expect of an adult, right? It's double, it's 36. And an older person, particularly 78, is going to get very tired with this, um, this uh, tremendous effort at breathing. So this tells me that, not, uh, that there is some benefit to the interventions that have been taken, but we have not concluded our, uh, our work with this patient. This patient is not just on the road to recovery. She still remains very unstable because that respiratory rate, despite our interventions, we ask for more oxygen and other things. Our respiratory rate has uh, increased and her O2-sat has remained the same, right? So she's had to increase her respiratory rate just to maintain that O2-sat. So, so while some things have been effective, blood pressure and her level of awareness her respiratory rate with that continued low uh, O2 sat is very concerning. And that's how you work your way through the case study and that's how you work your way through nursing. So as one thing results, we continue to go back. Now I need to really work on that. Okay, her blood pressure is back up. Uh, she's uh, more alert now, but we've given her some antibiotics. We've had that, she's had the first set of antibiotics and her respiratory rate is very high and that work of breathing is very high. So we need to address that. And there's lots of pathways by which we could address that. But understanding that uh, first go doesn't mean we're all done. It means we move on and we go through that process. So I'm assessing cues all over again, right? I'm assessing those cues. I'm making sense of them, right? So I'm saying, what do they mean? Then I'm generating some hypotheses and I'm making, uh, I'm making a determination about what is the most important of those uh, first or second hypotheses at least. I need to determine um, uh, what, uh, what steps need to be taken, what can I do, what action, and then I need to take that action. And then finally, I need to evaluate. So I'm gonna go through that cycle all over again, and in this case, down a different pathway. Okay, last wrap up. A uh, couple of things, really critical that we understand clinical judgment is learned through practice. So over and over and over again, we're going to bring you back to this practice as we increase that capacity with that clinical judgment as the foundation for your cognitive thinking in, in nursing. And we're going to increase the complexity of the situations that, you're, that you encounter. And that the CJMM, Clinical Judgment Measurement Model, teaches you a really critical skill that's going to help you to recognize deteriorating patients and to act early and appropriately and that is going to not just improve clinical outcomes, you're gonna save lives. And that's why you're here. It is so important to take some investment. It's really thinking through these steps all the time. It's training, um, just like an athlete trains themselves in a very rigorous way. 
uh, we're training our thinking in a very rigorous way. And that will become second nature to you. And that's so important because it will help you in your practice so that you can help your patients. I hope you found that helpful and I look forward to continuing on with our, with our discussions about this.